You know, there's the story told of this, uh, can you hear me in the back? This medical doctor who was at a dinner and uh, he went and leaned over to a man and he said, you know, I really am confused about going to all these dinners because everywhere I go, people bring all of their medical problems and ask me their questions at a social gathering. I don't know what to do. And the man said, very simple, go back home and the next day send them a bill. So he was very happy about that until the next day he got a bill from the lawyer from whom he consulted. <laughs> I get accustomed to going to social gatherings and answering people's questions, so I suppose I'll be doing that. <laughs> but just kidding. Uh, you know, T.D. Davis uh, was a remarkable man. If you never got to know him, uh, in a sense it was a sad loss for you, but you see the kind of life that he lived and the legacy that he has left behind. This year, uh, Beverly has very kindly loaned me D.D. Davis's Bible. So I've been using his Bible for my study, but not on the road. I'm just nervous about traveling with it in case I lose it or my suitcase doesn't show up. I don't want to lose a very treasured uh, ownership to that. But when I'm at home, I'm using that. I look at D.D. as in two ways. I look at him as a man of the word, he always had the Word of God in his pocket. He was a Gideon. In fact, for those of you who were at his funeral, you will remember, I think they had a copy of the Scriptures in his casket with him. He was a man of the Word in his study, in his... He even had it in Antarctica and said, I want, almost wanted to give it to the penguins out there because he's given it to, you know, on every continent. But he was also a man of his Word. Whatever he said, he honored and kept. Almost every contract that he took on was done with a shake of a hand because people could believe his word and know that he would deliver. And so at the 10th year anniversary of his passing, this tribute that has been done on the most precious truth of the word of God, the atonement, I think it's a wonderful time you have selected Phyllis. And of course Phyllis and Bruce were dearly beloved by him. It was through him that I met them, and over 20 years have gone by since that meeting. How many? 30. 30? Is it? My just goodness. About, just about. Yeah, just about. I know I don't look it, but it's been there. <laughs> but all those decades have gone by, and uh, I just want to mention one or two things to you about what I see in this work, not just actually, but in the concept of it. In the Bible, there's a very turning moment right in the early two or three chapters. And that turning moment is on the question, did God really say? Did God give his word? See, truth is primarily a property of propositions. When you are checking into truth, you're asking whether the reality corresponds to the assertion. Did God really say this? And the challenge comes from the tempter that whatever God said will not happen, you will not surely die. And the fascinating thing that I see about that interaction is a very simple question. Gee, God said in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, you know, you will be as God, knowing good and evil, and the, the God through, through the temptation as it ultimately comes. Did he really tell you not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The fact is that they were tempted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that they would be as God, meaning they would define good and evil. The definitions would change. It would no longer be God's definition. It would be their definition of defining good and evil. And the fascinating thing in our world today is when we have redefined what it is that God has actually said, you've taken a look at what the world has become when we change the definitions from what God had defined good and evil to be. Take a look at the globe around and you'll see how the redefinitions have changed. Now today, we do not know how to define love, 
We do not know how to define what it means to be human. We do not know how to define sexuality. We do not know how to define the family. All of this has come about because of our desire to play God and redefine everything that God had originally defined of what was good and what was evil. And when I look at what Phyllis has done in her artwork, I want to point out just two things that I believe are accomplished in this beautiful piece of art here because I think Phyllis takes it to a point that it ultimately needs to be taken to and is done exactly as God's word had reminded us. Listen to this quotation by Chesterton. Nothing sublimely artistic has ever arisen out of mere art any more than anything essentially reasonable has ever arisen out of pure reason. Let me read that line for you again. Nothing sublimely artistic has ever arisen out of mere art any more than anything essentially reasonable has ever arisen out of pure reason. There must always be a rich moral soil for any great aesthetic work. There must always be a rich moral soil for any great aesthetic work. And I think what you've done, Phyllis, is reminding us the kind of art that emerges when there is a rich moral soil. And when there's a terrible moral soil, you see what passes off as art and all the profanation that takes place as a result. People sometimes think that art is purely aesthetic, that it does not that it can only go with the imagination. But God gives us the boundaries of the aesthetic. He said to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, which means even beauty has a boundary if it is to be kept from becoming profane. So beauty is not merely imagination. The imagination has to have the boundary, else profane art and profane literature arises. Listen to the latest comedians. They really don't have any genius. It doesn't take genius to evoke laughter out of profanity and vulgarity. It is shock that is bringing about laughter. True geniuses, when you can keep decency and morality and goodness and still create a caricature and bring humor and bring laughter into it. What you've done, Phyllis, is lift us to the noble, lift us to the way God intended our definitions, the way God defined the beauty of holiness. And he reminds us of how the heavens declare the glory of God. But whether you realize it or not, you've done one thing more than just this statement. I want you to listen to me carefully. While we all look for rich moral soil, while we all look for moral reasoning around us because that provides the soil from which nobility can sprout, the ultimate problem is really not that we are immoral. The ultimate problem is that we are spiritually dead. Jesus did not come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people live. So out of the rich moral soil that this art has sprung, it actually points you to a greater truth. What is that greater truth? I just finished two open forums at Johns Hopkins University, where they, I was asked to speak on the problem of evil and suffering. And I raised the question one night. I said, here's my question to you. With all of the evil that you see around you that troubles you, have you ever paused long enough to be troubled by the evil that is inside you? That's where the real predicament is. The evil that is inside you. And what is the greatest provision that God has made? It is a provision that morality alone cannot bring to the rescue. What God has provided is the atonement, the sacrifice, the death of Christ that brings about the possibility of redemption. So what you're seeing in this artistic expression of a splendid truth is that the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers 
is the only hope for the redemption and transformation in your heart and mind. And so as you see those beautiful paintings, I hope you will see the blood and the pain and all of the tragedy that is represented in there and it is represented for you and for me. I close with these two little applications. At a prison in Louisiana, the Angola prison, a man who had committed a heinous crime and was given a life sentence without parole. I don't know what crime he committed because 85% of them were there on life without parole, 45 on death row, 5,300 prisoners there. And I spoke to that auditorium full and piped into every cell. And the man who led in the worship, fairly young, I looked at him and I said to him, are you here on life without parole? He said yes, because he came over to talk to me and he led in worship. I said to him, can I ask you a question? He said yes. I said, how does it feel to know you're never going to get out of here? It's 20 miles to the road from Angola prison. The whole prison is larger than Manhattan Island. And hound dogs, about 100 of them behind cages, so that if anyone tries to escape, those dogs will track you down. I said to him, how does it feel? to know you're never going to get out of here. I said, I want to hear from you. He said, Mr. Zacharias, if you knew the man I was, and that it took this prison in here to bring liberty to me and freedom to know Christ and to know my forgiveness, I am glad that I am here because that's what it took to bring to liberty, true liberty to me within. And then he said this, Please pray for my mom and dad. They're not in this prison, but they think they're actually free when they're living in a prison on the inside of them, which actually has them in greater change than I have. I'm okay out here. I found Christ, and now I'm leading here in worship in this prison. What a story of redemption. And that's what this art is representing. The blood of Christ for your redemption in mind. We live in a country where the moral soil is given for the artistic productions like this. We need to applaud such artists because the picture and the imagination takes you to the heavens. Here's the second application. Do you realize the whole problem in the Middle East today is based on one concept? Unforgiveness? Nobody wants to forgive. Nobody wants to forgive because nobody trusts. When you come to the cross, when you come to the cross, you find that forgiveness and that liberty. And until the world gets a glimpse of the cross, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for land and position and power and prestige. God sent His Son to keep us from sacrificing our own so that we can have the freedom within our hearts and within our lives. Phyllis, God bless you for the inspiration, for the effort, for the discipline. And when I look at you and the legacy of people like D.D. Davis, I just say to myself, God give us more people like these. He was a man of the word and he was a man of his word. He took God as his, at his word and allowed God to give the definitions of good and evil. You redefine good and evil, and you have a world that we see out there. Walt Disney once showed Billy Graham around Disney World, and as he was walking out of there, Billy Graham said to Walt Disney, it's a marvelous world of imagination that you have created in here. And Walt Disney said, Mr. Graham, no, you've got that the wrong way. This is the real world. You're walking out to a world of imagination that has been destroyed and created by man. This is the way it was all intended to be. <laughs> what a lesson. What a lesson for you and for me. And to you C.S. Lewis fellows who are being here under the leadership of Bruce, I just want to congratulate you. I think you're doing a wonderful thing. C.S. Lewis probably the greatest apologist of recent memory. Why? Because he was an artist with words. He knew how to paint pictures. He knew how to harness the imagination for the true, the beautiful, and the good. 
but he never bypassed reason. And through the front door of reason and the back door of the imagination, he pointed men and women to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So study to show yourself approved, and if you become a master of Lewis, C.S. Lewis, you will find you will always have an audience, because after Lewis's writings, I don't know any apologist who does apologetics without quoting C.S. Lewis. And if they do it without quoting C.S. Lewis, then they have picked their own pockets. <laughs> <laughs> impoverished in the process. 